Well, uh, my name is Dave Van Zandt. I'm the president here at the New School, and it's real, my real great pleasure to welcome everybody to the Parsons reunion. Uh, uh, this has become a real signature event for the university. It's great to have you all back. Let me see by our show of hands how many people took a tour of the Making Center. Wow, great, great. Well, I hope you liked it. Um, I hope you liked it. Good. And, you know, <laughs> Uh, some people even told us that, that the reason they came back was to take the tour of the making center. So it means is, uh, is I think someone said we need to do something. Uh, we'll have to do something else next, next year, right, Joel? Build something else? Yeah? I got a list of what we've been doing. I know. <laughs> um, well, it really is. I think with the opening of the making center, it's a great time to be a Parsons student. Um, if you happen to want to come back, we'll certainly be able to accommodate you. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, Parsons is all about the community and everybody seeing each other, seeing people in their class, other uh, people from other years at Parsons. That's what a strong community is about. And we're working very hard here at the new school um, to try to build that community among all of our, uh, among all of our um, alumni. Um, after this uh, program, please join us over in the, uh, in the Sheila Johnson Design Center, and Making Center actually, for a reception. Uh, there will be food and, and other things there. So please come over, uh, please come over and join us there. Um, one other thing I just want to mention, I hope many of you have seen the alumni exhibition. We had quite a few people uh, submit work for the exhibition. It's a real, it's a real uh, thrill to see all of that. But I also think it, it tells you what a Parsons student or even a new school student is like because we get just so many wonderful creative students and those very creative students you know, want to make a difference in the world uh, somehow. And uh, you can see it in that exhibition. You're going to see it here tonight on, on the stage. So without, without more, let me turn it over to our executive dean for Parsons, uh, Joel Towers. He's a very proud man because the Making Center was his idea to get it up there, and he pushed it forward. So we thank him for that. Take it away, Joel. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. Uh, before I begin with uh, the panel, I'd like to thank the Parsons Alumni Reunion Committee. Uh, this is made up of alumni who work uh, around the year to help us pull this event together. Um, Amanda Curtis, uh, Carly Ann Fergus, who I think was asking why the Making Center wasn't done a few years ago. Um, uh, G. Lee, Prithika Madhavan, uh, Esther Silber, Alvaro Soto, uh, Sava Tetriatikov, and Daniela Valesco. This is, like, you know, at graduation when you have to practice all the names, so. <laughs> um, thank you for, uh, for this year. Uh, that group represents alumni from as far back as 23 years ago to last year. There are three other alumni who I think are all here. I've seen two of them, and I hope the third came in while I was back, um, who I wanted to thank by name before we begin. Uh, Dee McDonald is here, and she, um, is on the Parsons Board of Governors. Uh, she chairs our alumni committee on the board, so she's very active in what happens around alumni. And she recently endowed the Mildred McDonald uh, Fund for Sustainability Innovation uh, in honor of her mother. So we're very happy to have Dee here. Thank you. Uh, right, right next to her usually is Kay Unger, right in front. Uh, another alum who is our chair of the Board of Governors, a trustee of the new school, and the founding funder of the Making Center. So um, if you enjoyed your walk through, uh, it's thanks to Kay. So thank you, Kay. And I, I hope Tess Dempsey's here. I know she's coming today. Um, if she's not, she's also a member of our Board of Governors for a very long time. She's supported the school very generously, and she worked with us extensively to design the Making Center as well, and all three of them I just wanted to give thanks to, as well as to Amy Garowitz, uh, who leads out alumni relations at the university and her entire team for pulling off this event. Thank you, Amy. So welcome, welcome to all of you, alumni, friends of Parsons, welcome back. Thank you. Uh, welcome to the campus. This is an exciting yearly event. I look forward to it every year. Um, we also want you to know and hope that you will reach out to us, and if we reach out to you, that you'll respond to us. <laughs> um, because we have lots of opportunities throughout the year 
uh, of events and activities um, going on at the, at the school, and we really would like you to take advantage of it, um, to, to continue to be here, so please do. Uh, each year the place looks a little bit different when you come back, sometimes a little different, sometimes a lot different. Um, this year I think is one of those lot different years with the Making Center, and I'm looking forward to celebrating in it. Um, I know Lucy was there, I don't know if the, th the other three have seen it yet, but uh, it's pretty exciting. But just in the last decade alone, you know, the Sheila Johnson Design Center opened, the Sheila and Arnold Aronson Galleries opened, the Anna and Marie Kellen Gallery opened, this University Center opened, and now this year the Making Center. So it really has been a pretty steady stream of um, extraordinary investments in the education here at Parsons, and that's really a testament to David's leadership, uh, and it's incredible um, to have been part of all of that. We're also uh, in the midst of a campaign. Parsons has never had a campaign for its future. We, we call it the Making Parsons campaign because we like making these days. Um, and it's a, a very ambitious goal to raise $50 million in endowment funding to support and sustain the growth of this extraordinary education. And we're about halfway there already, which is pretty amazing. So, um, so help us with that uh, and keep connected, keep engaged. Um, all of you are out there, um, representatives of, an, of this extraordinary place. The work that you do changes the world, and I think it is really exemplified this year um, by this next generation, if you will, uh, a, a recent generation of graduates um, on this panel. Uh, so I'm going to turn to the four of you, and tonight's um, agenda will be sort of the following. Uh, I'm going to ask each of our uh, alumni to speak very briefly, a hard thing to do, um, <laughs> about the work that they've been doing, and, uh, and then we're going to engage in a conversation and, and ask you to engage in that conversation, and I'll uh, introduce them um, as they, uh, as they um, uh, but right before they speak. Um, it is amazing to me that we have here in just these four representatives of um, 30 under 30. There are two 30 under 30 from Forbes here. We have uh, winners of um, uh, Fulbrights. We have uh, um, CFDA winners. We have, I mean, I, I have their bios here, and I had to shorten <laughs> their bios um, in order to not take too much time from their speaking. So it's a pretty <laughs> exceptional group of, of people that are here tonight, so thank you for coming. Um, it's, uh, to my left is Lucy Jones. Uh, to her left is Sophia Sunwu. Uh, next is uh, Nelson De Jesus Ubri, and then Angela Luna. So welcome back. Thanks. And we are going to start with Lucy. So um, Lucy is a BFA fashion design grad from 2015. This is the shortened version. Uh, <laughs> she's a recipient of the inaugural Social Innovator Fellowship, granting her a year-long residency at Eileen Fisher in partnership with the CFDA. In 2015, her thesis entitled Seated Design was awarded the Women's Wear Designer of the Year. And she was recently listed, as I mentioned, in Forbes 30 Under 30 for the class of 2016 for arts and style category. Lucy, it's all yours. Thank you very much for that introduction. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm Lucy, and I studied fashion design. Um, but whilst at Parsons, uh, I had great mentorship and professors who are now my friends. Um, and they sort of encouraged me to challenge the status quo, as many Parsons students are challenged. Um, and also, in, it wasn't until my senior year, really, that I was uh, I was granted the freedom to look back on some of my original design ideas from previous classes and to unlock them to their fullest potential. So um, my thesis originated, my senior thesis, originated from a conversation with my younger cousin Jake. Um, and Jake has hemiplegia, which means he has paralysis along the left side of his body. And whilst Jake can do most things of his day-to-day -day activities, the one thing that was one of his biggest challenges was getting dressed. And when he told me that, it was something I'd never considered before. And this conversation took place around four years ago. And I asked him, he was having a pretty bad day that day, and just from the lack of independence, and he has good and bad days. But on this particular day, I asked him what it would mean 
for him to have a pair of trousers that he could you know, do up with one hand. And he told me it would be the next step up from not having a disability altogether. Mm. And that was when I realized that that was fashion design and that's what I wanted to do. So seated design was, um, it was a manual. Um, we can hit the next slide. <laughs> I didn't realize. Yeah, I've, I think we have to run it from up there because we don't have anything to move it with. Yeah, visuals are great. That's one thing I learned from Parsons. <laughs> yeah. There it is. My name oh, is... Nice. There it is. We can go back. I'm great. Do we have a flicker? Thank the you. The green one. Is it the green? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so um, this is a little piece that was on the New York Times, but seated design was really a manual that um, looked at our current design infrastructure, and it, it was a way of implementing design solutions and functionalities from the very beginning of the design process to uh, make sure that disability was accounted for. So it wasn't so much a full collection, but what it was was it was really showing that we can look at our larger system and look at a portion of society that's often overlooked in um, fashion design. So um, by looking, by addressing sort of an unmet need, um, I truly believe that we are opening uh, new avenues for design that is infinite, and that's something that I strongly believe in. And this sort of led to me this sort of led me to my uh, residency at Eileen Fisher in collaboration with the CFDA, the Council of Fashion Designers of America. Now this one year residency um, was with two other girls, uh, Carmen Gamma and Tetlin Dowd. And not only are these two girls my friends, they were also Parsons grads. <laughs> so we won all three spots yeah. that year, just, so was, just saying. Yeah, just <laughs> typical. Uh, 60 schools took part in this and three of us sort of took it. So that was great. Um, and during this residency, I don't know if you know Eileen Fisher, but she is a phenomenal leader. She um, is so empowering, and she kind of gave us free reign to come up with a solution for the 80,000 damaged garments that were saved from going into landfill. So kind of crazy. Um, so we did make a dent in that 80,000, and we managed to produce a 500-piece limited edition collection, which we sold uh, at a pop-up store called Remade in the USA. And that was in the last two weeks of July, and it was very successful. So after Eileen Fisher, my residency ended two months ago, I decided to um, start my own company because I'm crazy. Um, <laughs> my dad thinks I'm crazy. <laughs> but basically, I call myself a solution-based designer. And what I really love is that I can work with many different people. I'm not tied down to one specific organization. But I can learn from one and pass on to the other. And that is what I state up front, is I want to be sharing and making sure the dialogue continues. So I can share with you a few things that I'm up to right now. Um, some things I can't share, but some things I can. So um, in April, I will be uh, exhibiting in the Mad Museum as part of uh, the Fashion After Fashion, little f and big f, exhibition co-created by Hazel Clark and Hilary Laminen. And it'll take place April 27th through July. So I will be doing a few pieces for that. Um, I'm also partner with Karen Ware, a medical innovation company team, uh, deemed healthware. And what we do is we create accessories and products that better the medical system. Um, and then my last collaboration is with a nonprofit, Runway of Dreams, where I'm an ambassador and design consultant. And what we do is we adapt mainstream clothing to include individuals with disabilities or the more well-known one is the Tommy Hilfiger collaboration, which we're very proud of, and it was extremely successful. So I want to leave you with one last thing. And I was really lucky last month to attend the White House, which was crazy. Um, <laughs> I actually had an email, and it was like the White House, and I thought it was a spam for my social security number, so I nearly <laughs> junked it. Um, but I did a say yes, and I did go. And the conference was called Design for All, and it was a celebration for the advancement of um, prosthetics, assistive technology, and of course, fashion design. Now, whilst this event was so amazing to see how this movement is taking place, which is super exciting. Uh, one of the quotes that I took away and I want to share with you today um, was 
can we call design radical or revolutionary until it benefits every single body? Mm. And I think that is something that I'm going to work towards and I will be designing in that way from now on. So thank you for listening and I'll see you at the reception. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. You're not, you're not done yet, Lucy. We have to talk a little bit afterwards, but, but you can rest for a moment while we go to, and you can pass along the uh, slide advancer to Sophia. Sophia Sun Wu is a graduate from 2010 of the BBA program in strategic design and management. She was listed as a leading force in social entrepreneurship and in Forbes 30 under 30 list in 2016. She was awarded the Fred Alger Finance Award and was a New York pitch finalist at Elle Magazine's Impact Two Awards. Sophia is the co-founder of the Water Collective, an organization founded to fix and prevent water, broken water projects in the developing world by building community ecosystems of water maintenance care. Since 2012, the organization has provided fresh water to over 76,000 people in West Africa. Sophia. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for coming out today. I'm so excited to get to share my story and come back to Parsons. It's been a long time. Uh, so I've been an entrepreneur for 10 years now, and Parsons was really intertwined in that journey for me. Uh, so uh, when I was, this is actually the yeah. wrong order. OK. So when I was 19, I started this clothing company uh, with a friend of mine, and we started it because we uh, would go to all these band concerts, but we hated all the, all the unisex t-shirts they would sell there. So we're like, oh, we're just gonna make the clothing that we wanna wear at these concerts. So uh, we built that company, and we built it from like a fun place, and um, it accidentally got successful. We ended up in 250 retailers. Miley Cyrus wore it, and it just blew up. Um, and it was a, it was, kind of a hard uh, experience for me because ever since I was nine years old, I'd wanted to be a clothing designer. Um, but then as soon as I got that dream and I built that company, I was done with it. I was so sick of it and I, it wasn't something that I liked doing anymore. Um, so, and at the time when that was happening, we were so lucky and we were able to find someone to buy the company from us. So it was a very good transition. Um, but internally, it was a struggle for me where, um, I just didn't know how to come to terms with letting go of something that was so successful and then kind of moving on from that. Like, how do you live up to something that did so well? Um, so while I was at Parsons, I, for my senior thesis, I experimented with this concept. And this was like back in the day when um, uh, Design for the Billions, Design for the Other, 99% uh, was just starting. And it was kind of this budding idea. and. Uh, I somehow caught wind of it, and it was actually the uh, lecture that a professor was giving. It was like a seminar class, and he um, was talking about how designers could actually um, do something when it came to the climate, cr climate change and poverty, and it kind of blew my mind, because when you're in a classroom setting, you're often told about all these other people that have done great things in the past, and just like the professor going on and on about their accomplishments, but it's very rare when you're in a classroom setting and the professor kind of questions you and asks you, like, what can you do? You know, how can you be a part of the future? So it really pushed me and it really um, gave me a lot of confident, confidence and it exploded my brain a bit, like, oh my goodness, like, how actually can I get involved with this? So I spent my senior thesis exploring this idea of natural disasters and when you're in a developing community, you don't have first response, how do you protect yourself? So I developed this idea of, uh, for whatever reason, I had this intuition at the time that um, it wasn't about like these fancy schmancy tech solutions when it came to um, providing solutions for the developing world. It was actually thinking back to what works, and it, it was so ingrained in this like design strategic thinking of like let's forget about all the fancy stuff like. Let's go back to the human-centered like centered aspect of this and figure out what do people want. So that was something that just like really catapulted my thinking to the next level. Um, so uh, about a year and a half after I graduated from Parsons, you know, I had this idea ingrained in my head from my senior thesis. And um, I was at a corporate job, absolutely hated my life. 
But, um, and I kept having like this idea that I developed for my senior thesis just like keep on popping into my head. And um, one day I was just like, I can't take it anymore. I don't know what my next step is, but I know that like I want to pursue what I finished at Parsons and I really want to see where that takes me. Um, the day I quit my job and I went to celebrate my last day with my coworkers, I ended up meeting my co-founder for what would become Water Collective. Um, so yeah, so my, for the second startup that we started um, about five and a half years ago now, um, it was a, it came from this place again of like, let's stop thinking about like the fanciest water solution we can think of. Let's think of when we're going into a rural community and working with um, the people there, like what do they actually want? Let's start from, let's start going backwards rather than from top down. Uh, so it's been a really incredible experience where we created, instead of creating like, as you can see, this task stand is very basic, and, but we chose that and worked with that with the community because that's what works, because that's what they, when it comes down to it, you know, after you see this like beautiful picture of the kids smiling and having water, like what happens 10 years from that point? And that was something that we wanted to really dive into. What happens to these water systems? Why is it that almost half of them in most um, African countries break after two years. Like that's unacceptable, that's ridiculous that anyone should accept that and keep moving forward, you know, building water projects. So yeah, we've like really dove into this unsexy side of water, which is maintenance. You know, we, we talk about maintenance, maintenance education. We, um, all of our programs revolve around repetition. You know, we figure out how do people in this communities learn information and we use that data to figure, to kind of form our maintenance program so we um, go through retention, inf retain, retaining information, you know, repeating information in a way that people will remember it years from now and then um, teach their children that same information. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, that's kind of the same old. And, um, I, and another aspect that Parsons has really brought something really great out of me and a really great lesson I've learned is that Parsons really like got me out of my shell where you know I was in this stage in my life where I was so terrified to move on from um, this um, beautiful like ivory tower of something that I was successful with when I was younger and it really gave me the courage to move on and also like honor my evolution as an entrepreneur like accepting the fact like this is my next chapter. Um, so yeah, Water Collective is something that has grown into something beautiful. We have a team of six in Cameroon that run to day to day um, and I'm continuing to um, honor my evolution. I currently am working on my third startup. Um, I coach social entrepreneurs to build revenue-rich startups so they can, I can help other entrepreneurs do exactly what I've built in the past 10 years. Um, yeah, thank you so much for listening to me. Great, super. <clears throat> <laughs> thank you, Sophia. Um, the bar just keeps getting higher. This yeah. was, when I talked to these guys the other day, it was just, anyway, blows my mind away. Uh, Nelson de Jesus uh, is a BFA architectural design graduate from 2015. He's practicing junior designer at HECO Inc. He's also an instructor at, instructor at Dimension Learning, a nonprofit organization that provides STEM education to New York City uh, students. He's currently teaching 3D printing and computer aided design to middle school students in Harlem. He's been developing a project called Upstream Windward, Downstream Leeward, a research project that analyzes the Dominican Republic's infrastructure and architecture, and was recently awarded a Fulbright grant to further his research in 2017. Nelson. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm Nelson, and um, Parsons and I go back way, way back. Um, I started attending Parsons as a 10th grader in high school, actually, through the Parsons Pre-College program. Um, and it was the first time I really got exposed to the design world, uh, through painting, drawing. It was uh, every semester taking class after class, taking my very first architectural class as an 11th grader. And it just, uh, once I reached my senior year, it just felt natural to come to Parsons because I was pretty much shaped to be a Parsons student. <laughs> uh, and so uh, at this point, um, it, was, it was really amazing to to the involvement um, of my um, mentality, of my uh, way of looking at architecture. And even though I always have my mindset in um, pursuing architecture, it was always good to see how I could bring um, fine arts and, um, and uh, sometimes product design and, um, and even fashion into how architecture could really influence my life. 
And so Parsons, um, as, a, as a Parsons student, I got exposed to a lot of international uh, experiences, like going to Parsons Paris through the Parsons College program, but also uh, getting very political, like going to the White House as well, uh, to develop uh, the very, one of the very first fashion, um, fashion workshops to promote educational education in the United States. It's hosted by the uh, First Lady Michelle Obama. And it was a great experience because it got me exposed to how architecture um, can start to become combined with foreign affairs, which is a topic that I greatly, greatly enjoy. And um, this is where C2, uh, this is where uh, upstream downstream uh, is born. It's like my very uh, my thesis project for my last semester at Parsons, and it is a project that I um, took. It's a very personal project because um, I was born and grew up in the American Republic and lived there 15 years, and I experienced. Um, hurricanes pretty much almost every hurricane season. And so there was a, very mo a couple of them that still uh, are stuck in my mind to see the destruction they cause. And it still are still causing, like Matthew hurricane that just struck Haiti um, last week. And so I saw that there was a, I've ex myself experienced these phenomena and I know the disaster they cause and um, how it changes lives um, and affect them uh, forever. They change the landscape of where you live um, in, in, like irreversibly. Uh, and so um, at this point, I started developing um, Situ Aguacero. And um, it is a project where I take a specific watershed uh, in the Dominican Republic, southern, pro uh, southern province of the Dominican Republic. And it's the watershed that I grew up in, which is the watershed that I know best. Um, and at this point, um, I'm, to my analysis and uh, the research that I'm starting to conduct, uh, trying to develop to see how architecture um, combined with urban design can start to develop resilient solutions um, that can help communities that are, have been living for generations along uh, the river basins uh, throughout the American Republic to develop uh, more resilient housing using local materials that are known best. Usually the culture specifically in the American Republic but also in many uh, regions in the Caribbean, um, in many parts of the world, um, is that people build their homes themselves. Um, they don't necessarily hire architects or engineers. And so this is a, one of the starting points for this project because I want to keep this empowerment very much alive. Um, as an architect myself, I want to uh, learn from materials they use, the culture, um, how they uh, really uh, enable themselves to uh, keep going after hurricanes and after uh, being slammed and all the homes getting destroyed, their infrastructure being disconnected from city center, uh, aid being cut off uh, for various reasons. And so how can I learn from all the, learn all the experience to develop these types of uh, research? And so as a person's graduate and now as a Fulbright scholar, um, I'll be departing next, uh, next year, uh, January, to develop this research, 10 months, where I've become affiliated with different um, institutions in the Dominican Republic. Uh, Specifically, INRI, which is the institution that cons, uh, control, controls the waterways and rivers and um, names in the American Republic, so they know best how waterways function and how these um, are managed. And so it's like a, uh, my gateway into um, systems and see learning from it and, and, and developing. And the Dominican Republic um, is, is, uh, is uh, as my home, uh, my native country. I'm taking it as a case study because I want to take this project further. Uh, out into how I can, it can be implemented in other countries in the Caribbean and other places that, uh, that are affected by hurricanes, which is all over the world. You have typhoons in, in, in Southeast Asia, you have hurricanes in the North Atlantic Basin, um, and it's just like everybody's affected by this type of phenomenon, and it's just a matter of how, where we start um, developing the solutions to then be implemented um, elsewhere. And so as a Fulbright scholar and previously a Gilman scholar, I'm using the network I've been creating at the Department of State uh, to catapult and, and really use the, um, the connection uh, between, the, the, to use the Department of State as my, de my departing point to really start to create uh, bridge, uh, bridges between countries that are really affected by the same issues and uh, that really uh, focusing on these, uh, on these, um, on these solutions um, will not only affect one, but many countries, many people in many places of the world. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Nelson. Finally, uh, Angela Luna, who's our most recent grad, she's just recently grad and <laughs> graduated in 2016, uh, BFA in fashion design, um, and was, like Lucy, the winner of the Designer of the Year, the Women's Wear Designer of the Year, as well as the Eyes on Talents Innovation Award. 
Her work has been featured in numerous publications, including the New York Times, Business Insider, Fashionista, among others, due to her dedication to using innovative design to engage global issues, uh, specifically the refugee crisis. Angela? Thanks, Joel. Okay, so um, I have a video at the end of this, so I'm not gonna try to like repeat myself too much, but I'll give you guys a little intro. So um, my thesis senior year was, or last year actually, um, was focused on using design to create solutions for refugees. So uh, for me, this project really just kind of came from a sense of helplessness. You know, living in New York, going to the best fashion school in the U.S., and um, reading about these issues online and seeing all these images and watching all these documentaries and feeling so far from this issue, but wanting to offer some form of assistance. And, you know, obviously I didn't go to school for political science or human rights or humanitarian action. I went, I went to fashion school. So it was really about me trying to figure out how to use my skills in design and my skills in fashion um, to create solutions for refugees. So uh, basically that just came from, you know, looking at issues refugees face on a daily basis, whether it was um, need for shelter, lack of sleep, uh, flotation, uh, carrying children, or um, needing to be seen or needing to hide. And so the majority of the research that I conducted was um, through online sources, through articles, documentaries, videos, um, talking with some volunteers who had experienced refugee camps as well as some major nonprofits. Um, I had tried for almost a year to get access to a refugee camp and so now I finally um, will be going to Greece to test all the products. But yeah, super exciting. Um, it's really slow. The nonprofit world is very slow. <laughs> but um, yeah, so Everything I did was analyzing the issues refugees face daily and trying to address uh, them with design in some way. So the result was um, an all gender, one size collection um, with pieces that have multiple functions and uh, can really address these, these day to day issues. And um, everything's waterproof, uh, weatherproof, uh, prepared to be worn in numerous environments. And now that I am going forward into production, it will be sustainable materials as well. I'm talking with some really cool companies that use um, trash from the poorest areas of the world and convert it into recycled polyester. So really exciting um, talking with these companies. But uh, yeah, this is actually also a picture of me. Um, I was just in France a few weeks ago presenting at the Positive Economy Forum, which was, uh, you know, just a lot of nonprofits as well as political um, people as well as designers uh, meeting together and discussing uh, positive influence on the world through design, economics, whatever. So um, very exciting to go there. I was dubbed in French, which was super cool. I do speak <laughs> French, but not that well. <laughs> but anyway, so um, I believe we have a video attached as well. Could we play the video? The Diff is a humanitarian fashion brand. It's a bunch of transformable garments. There's jackets that transform into tents, a sleeping bag or a backpack, as well as some jackets that are equipped for carrying children, flotation, and visibility. I was not involved in social causes for the majority of my life. I got my news through Facebook. The transition actually, it almost happened overnight. I'm Angela Luna, and I am the founder and president of ADIF. I was reading an article online and looking at a video of a news journalist who was on board a smuggler's boat. It was the middle of the night, the boat's motor broke down, and these people were stuck in the middle of the Aegean Sea. As I was looking at this video, I thought to myself, if these people were wearing reflective clothing, it would be a lot easier for them to be spotted. Reading about the refugee crisis in Syria, and just feeling so helpless, like I'm, I'm here doing fashion design at this, this amazing school in New York, you know, I just really wanted to find a way to help. Right from the get-go, she had a, a really great idea, and I said, go with what you're committed to. Like, if you start to create something that's bigger than yourself, then, you know, that's where the game is, really. And so she just really completely took the challenge on. I've actually only gone camping once in my life, so a lot of research going into it, a lot of trial and error. I kind of identified the problems that could be addressed through design and then tried to design purposefully for the people who need them most. All the clothes are weatherproof, waterproof, and prepared to be worn in numerous environments. They're all unisex and one size. 
For so long, fashion has been considered as detached from global concerns. This collection changes that narrative and offers like new hope for the industry, but it can be something else. It can be a movement for change on a political scale as well. She is a change maker. She gets to be able to step out and actually challenge the things that are happening globally, challenge the industry, innovate within the industry. It was just a really kind of like perfect moment just to see that. Well, the idea for the collection is really to appropriate the money that comes into the fashion industry and have it go to support the global good so that way donations don't really need to rely on um, government grants or nonprofit grants. When you purchase a part of the collection, a portion of the proceeds will go towards donating these garments to refugees. And so your purchase is gonna actually feed into the donations of these garments to the people who need them. It's really exciting to have this become my whole life's work now. Everyone always says if you find a job that you love, you never, you never work a day in your life. And that's really how it is with this collection. I'm so glad to be finding a way to help fashion, help people. First of all, thank you, all four of you. Um, it's, uh, it's such a pleasure, first of all, to have you all back here. Um, so relatively soon after graduation, uh, and in some cases very soon after graduation. I never left. I've been here all it's summer. It's true. I, <laughs> I, I feel I've like really I've been here all summer. So. Um, but the, 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 and I want you all to be able to ask each other questions, but I'm, I'm really struck when I listen to your stories uh, about how the work you did here has inspired you to continue to do work outside to, to after your graduation, to continue that work, to deepen that work, um, to really make uh, a significant impact on the world, to make change, positive change. And it's a message that we talk a lot about um, when we think about our curriculum. It's a message we talk a lot about when we think about uh, the way we teach here. It's something that is connected deeply to the entire university. Uh, and really represents, I think, a big change in Parsons over the course of really the last decade or so. Um, that, that the work that's, under, that's undertaken in the studios and in the seminars here prepares you or inspires you or challenges you to do this kind of, um, to make a new path, which was the idea of this panel, to say what are dif different ways to pursue your work after you graduate other than a more traditional um, entry into a studio or a work environment. Mm -hmm. well, one of the things that I'm intrigued by uh, in this path that you've pursued is that it sidesteps a kind of known pathway to acquiring new knowledge of working for somebody else. You know, I'm often, when I speak to some of our alumni who've been out more than a few years, <laughs> um, one of the things that I always hear back is, well, the younger generation really needs to learn more about how things are in the world. And you should work in this kind of apprentice-like environment. You guys have just blown past all of that, right? <laughs> so, so what's your strategy for acquiring new knowledge? How do you go about continuing to do the work you're doing? Because you're, you're going to be confronted with challenges that others have been confronted by. And how do you make sure that you're continuing to learn? Because it seems to me it's a different path. Mm -hmm. Um, and, I don't, I've, and I've known you all, and I don't know any of you to think that there isn't wisdom and knowledge to be gained from others. In fact, you're all very connected and networked and working in ways. But how do you go about doing that? I mean, what's the method that you think about when you're trying to learn more? Um, I don't think I have method <laughs> at all. Um, I've never, no, I've never really known. I just always focus on my gut feeling mm. because that's one thing I've relied on. And if it's saying, like, that this isn't good, then I won't do it. But in terms of learning, I feel like I'm learning every single day, no matter what I'm doing. And, and during my thesis, I remember there was about halfway through my thesis, um, so it was nearly December time, I said to myself, I'm not a fashion designer at mm. all. Mm. I'm a physiotherapist, a psychologist, a counselor, because part of what I was doing was not just sitting with a model and designing, it was listening, um, it was collaborating, and I don't think there's a method to that at all, because it was just, I was just learning every single day, and it was, um, it was very eye-opening that, that I guess that was my path, and that's still what I'm doing with mm -hmm. everything I do, is, 
it just kind of unfolds and I don't have a method really. Well, I think that uh, I, when I hear um, older generations saying that like, you know, I get that a lot from my parents where they're like, who do you think you are that you're, you know? Um, but I tell them that our, our generation is living in a very different world right now. Like we can open up our Facebook and we um, have access to all this information that, uh, you know, for example, when I was starting like my first startup, I never had access to information so immediately. Like it took me months to research something, but nowadays, you have this capability and millennials have this capability and I guess like all generations now have this capability where they can open up their social feeds and they can gain this on like in incremental ways on a day to day, like an education on the refugee crisis, like what's going on um, on different spheres. Um, they're really getting a master's degree whether they know it or not on a day to day and I think like that is something that's so different where you're learning so much um, at a small volume so people don't notice it as much, but mm -hmm. it's something that I feel like has been a huge shift for me where like my startups now are building way faster than my first startup did mm -hmm. because of that information access. Um, and I think another thing is that um, because of growing up in Parsons and like all of my friends um, that I graduated with are very entrepreneurial as well. Like we've all learned to mentor each other. Like I have a business coach that I work with because I think that when you're in the traditional sphere of you know you have HR to help you with that, um, we all learned that we have to create our own HR where like you know you hire the people you need to hire, you hire the strategists and you know you go out, you go out with your Parsons friend and like you know bounce ideas off of each other. So. Yeah, we've all figured out, I feel, um, a way to create our own HR in the sense to like keep developing ourselves to the next level. The kind of network of yeah. people that you're, I mean, I, I noticed that you and Angela are mm -hmm. kind yeah. of, uh, you've started some kind of. Yeah, and I'm in 10, yeah, she's 2010 out, so. and 2016 here. Yeah. Right, so you never met, you didn't know each other when. You, no, I reached out to her because I saw her on Fast Company. I was like, you are doing something really cool, let's and talk. And I was like, help me please. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. yeah. So. I guess for me, the way that allows me to learn the most is uh, really being open. After my senior year of Free Parsons, I was like, it was, this project really had a lot to do with it because I let go of, of, of really thinking of, of this project as uh, something that was uh, very timeline based. Like, it was like, a, there was a deadline to this, and there's not, it was, like, it was like, how can I just let go of whatever I think I know? And, and being open to different uh, fields, different research. And, and um, it, was, it happened a lot in this one project because I, I move away from thinking of this project architecturally into thinking of it like I'm starting, like, I was starting engineering, uh, farming, and, and ecology, hydrology, typography. Mm -hmm. Like, these are all fields that like, influence architecture, but like, once you get into them, you get so, they're so blended together that like, it creates a blur that is quite fascinating. And it's just like, it, it allows you to really learn. And that's where a lot of um, a lot of the a lot of collaborations started to happen, and it started to happen back in with my my same class. Like there were a lot of, uh, especially during my last class, my last, my spring class, there was a uh, our professor Robert Kurt, but he he merged us. He was like, "Well, architects and Prague Center and come together to really get out of that shell of being together with the same group of people for four years. Mm. Um, how can you then?" interact with each other and learn from each other's way of developing projects. And this is like really breaking out of that shell that you kind of create yourself over four years uh, and then uh, to, really, um, to really learn from what they're doing and how and you see how their projects are, how we, we saw how our projects are to connect in so ways that we, many ways that we didn't really notice or saw from afar, but once we started talking about it and seeing, oh, this, they're so similar, like that completely expanded our way of knowledge. And, and, it enabled us to really um, look farther, uh, uh, farther than our own projects into how their projects can then influence our projects and then we can start creating a conversation as to how more change can happen. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I always say, um, I guess it's kind of like going back to what you said, um, I feel like I'm doing being an entrepreneur being an entrepreneur wrong because you know generally you're supposed to get a job first and then work for 20 years and then kind of go on your own but then I found out something very interesting it's like okay well 
I was kind of limiting myself because I was like, oh, I don't know if I can be an entrepreneur right out of school because I don't, I don't really know how to do this. I don't really know what I'm doing. And then I found out no one knows what they're doing. <laughs> so, you know, you just you hustle and you fake it till you make it, and you know, you do the best you can. And um, you know, every day is a learning experience. Um, you know, before you, when I graduated, I, I only knew like the language of fashion, and now I feel like I'm learning the language of business every single day. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know. You pull your resources, and it's it's great that we have so many at Parsons too. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you do get a lot of experience. I think working with other people and um, working for other companies before. But you know, if if there's a need for something, if there's a need for something now, you shouldn't really hold off on your dream and what you could offer just because you think you need to have more experience. I think um, it's important. Like if if there's a need for your product and there's a need for what you're doing. Um, you should just get it out there as soon as you can, and the rest will come kind of as you learn. And do you, do you think that's a generational thing, as Sophia is saying? I mean, I, I'm, your, your video where you talk about um, when you first started to read about what was happening in Syria and decided that was, a, that was where you wanted to, you know, it inspired the work mm -hmm. that you took on, and you had great mentorship from faculty here, but you were inspired by that moment. There's the climate change challenge that Sophia experienced. It's the conversation that you have that, that drives you to say, this is what I, I want to do. Mm -hmm. It's the knowledge of, of the challenges of where you grew up that says, I, I can do something different here, right? So you're all, and I'm curious if you feel that's both a generational question, that there's this combining of the access to information, networking, technology, mm -hmm. with a commitment to say, um, we can change I would how this definitely. place yeah. is. Yeah. yeah, I mean, like even with social media, I mean, with Facebook or even Twitter, you can see what's happening on the other side of the world in a second. Like, there are no barriers between cultures, no barriers between language, because mm -hmm. obviously we can Google Translate everything. So um, I think the world is getting a lot smaller, and we're getting more involved in um, every single area. And I think um, being millennials, we're you know, very forward with social media and um, trying to help others, too. So I definitely think that's something that we're going to see from our generation and the, the people coming after us, too. Yeah. Yeah, it's an amazing hybrid that you you pull together, which really, it's um, it's very rewarding to hear you all speak <laughs> from where <laughs> I sit. Um, we want to take some questions from all of you, and I think we have some microphones. Uh, so if there are any, um, you could raise your hand and someone will bring you a microphone. There's one in the middle, I think. Hey, uh, my name is Terrence, and I'm currently a sophomore uh, studying fashion. So I just watched a video, which is very interesting. And then I have a question that the purpose of immigrants and also refugee to move to another country is to um, feel the culture and also immerse themselves in another culture. So if your garment is so identifiable mm. as, um, say, refugee garments, then how could they actually immerse themselves in another culture uh, in terms mm. of being so easy and also like they can interact with people normally. So that's my question. Thanks, that's a good question. I actually have gotten that one before, so um, I have a good answer. <laughs> um, so the way the business is kind of structured, I should have explained this a little bit more before, is that um, you know this collection is gonna be available for purchase, uh, sold towards like the outerwear market, um, specifically within hiking and camping, as well as you know millennials who just care about um, the business model that supports donations. So, um, so you can purchase these clothes yourselves. I see it kind of more as a unifier. So these clothes, you can wear them. We're also donating them to refugees. Um, the ones that will be donated to refugees will be um, less aestheticized just because, you know, I've been told many times that refugees don't care so much about the color of their jackets. They just care that it's going to keep them warm. It's going to stay together and, you know, use, do its purpose. So. Um, yeah, so when a refugee comes to a new culture, a new place wearing these garments, you know, I do hope that there are people in those countries as well wearing, you know, the same versions of these jackets, so that way it's more of an unspoken understanding saying that I support you, um, I'm glad you're here, you know, it's, I see it as more something that's bringing us together as opposed to something that's isolating a refugee who's new to an area, but, um, yeah, so that, that's kind of how I see it. I hope that it works out that way. Um, there has been a lot of press in uh, Europe as well, so hopefully we can get these products over there and you know, really create that sense of unity and sense of welcome, welcoming to these people. But um, 
Yeah, I definitely see it um, more as an advantage as opposed to a disadvantage. Thanks. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. Yes, hi. Um, I, I just, I think you kind of answered the question when I saw your video. Um, I just needed, just wanted to know if, if you guys can just um, elaborate more on the, um, the struggles that you have as far as you're putting out and you're doing work that's good for the community and the world itself, yet you're still trying to form a business that is profitable. So I was wondering if you could just speak more along those lines. And, and tell us your name and when you graduated. I'm a graduate of 84 and my name is Terry Cummings. Things. Should, I, should I go first? Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, so when I was kind of like analyzing um, business structures and how much money, you know, fashion makes and how much nonprofits make and, you know, really trying to decide whether or not to make this business a nonprofit or a for-profit, um, something that really struck out was that, you know, everyone is wearing clothes, fashion is everywhere, and the fashion industry gets so much more money than, you know, a lot of industries, so why is it that we should keep this money to ourselves? Um, I think when you have a socially conscious, conscious business model similar to like Tom's or Warby Parker or um, Feed Projects, um, you're allowing the money that comes into the industry to go towards helping other people. So that way, you know, we're not hiding all the money in the fashion industry to ourselves. It's going back and giving back and, you know, making a difference on a global scale as opposed to uh, just, you know, within the fashion industry. But um, yeah, I definitely think it is possible to have for-profits with nonprofit components. I th hope that that's where, um, you know, business is going to be going in the future because I do think there's a lot of potential for that kind of business strategy. But yes, I mean, it is important to be able to get the money and to pay the bills. And uh, mm -hmm. um, But it, also, it is also equally as important to get these products back and to, to give back to the, the people that, that need us the most. So. Um, for me, I guess there's not, there's not a, a real business component to my project, but there's, there's definitely um, some immersion that, I, uh, that has to happen uh, and understanding because um, it's a project that I'm trying to develop. Um, it comes into communities that are already, they have a way of living, they have a culture. And, and whenever I, I, I come back, I have, have, having lived in the American Republic for 10 years and coming back, he, um, I myself have to like get embedded again into the culture, um, but um, it's a, I've, I've, as I develop this project, um, I definitely need to learn from the communities and, and how uh, how important these uh, homes uh, where they live, even though it may be on the basin of a river, uh, is to uh, local people because um, I do not want to, for example, come off as a an intruder to uh, a. Um, an intruder to uh, something that may be foreign to me, uh, something that I, I am familiar with for the past 10 years. Um, because like many of people that you find in um, these areas that are set in their ways, are, they've been there for generations. And, and, and this is homes that have come, how, go, they go back two, three, four generations. And how do you explain to people that your home is in a flood area that will get destroyed eventually by a river uh, and it is a matter of time? Uh, and so how did you then really come in and, 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 and really have this transition that is smooth enough for them to uh, see how the world and the climate is changing and how we're all being affected um, either via the river that is next to us or via the overall climate um, and how it's something that is uh, many times a bit intangible because it's like it's a process that happens over a period of time that can be longer than one's lifetime. I mean, how can you start now? to move on and start creating a uh, dense into problem as we move along. Mm -hmm. My biggest challenge for me has been, um, you know, I didn't grow up in the nonprofit world, um, but I've spent five and a half years in it now, and uh, it's been hard for me to, like, my personal belief is that I don't believe that nonprofits should be poor. Like, this mentality of scarcity that nonprofits don't have enough money, there's nonprofits don't deserve the money, which to me is ridiculous because nonprofits are what keep our streets clean. You could walk out the door and not get assaulted or attacked because of the work of a nonprofit. Like nonprofits allow corporations to thrive, they allow corporations to grow their businesses in safe environments. So um, it's been hard for me to um, come into a space like this where it's just a, such opposing to my beliefs where, you know, I believe that when you're growing a new idea as an entrepreneur, you should have a space to play. Like, and I think that's like so aligned with 
what I learned at Parsons is like the reason why I grew my initial idea for my thesis was because someone gave me room and time to play, and they like um, they questioned me and pushed me to like keep developing, developing my and evolving my idea into something incredible. Um, and when you're working in a space that doesn't like funding play, they don't like funding experiments or rest, it's kind of hard to figure out where your place is in that and do you kind of accept that as is or do you kind of, do you say I'm going to figure out something else and forge my new road? Um, so yeah, that's been my biggest challenge for me and uh, it's been an interesting journey <laughs> figuring that out. Yeah, so um, I think my biggest challenge, which is when I said when I started my own company, um, why my dad had a heart attack. Um, is because I don't really have a strong business <laughs> brain. Um, so that was obviously a big struggle. Um, I'm definitely more of the creative side. Um, so I, what I do is I stay up late every single night reading lots of, uh, yeah, on the internet, just reading and reading and reading and absorbing. But I also surround myself with people who do know the business, mm -hmm. so I don't exhaust myself. Mm -hmm. And so I do get the chance to be creative. Um, and, you know, a lot of them are actually from Parsons, you know. Um, Kay has been fantastic help <laughs> to me. She's my emotional support system. Um, and, you know, and also Karen Ware. Um, he's uh, the founder of Karen Ware. Um, Chaitanya Rasden, he is from, you know, he's a banker from Wall Street. So <laughs> listening to him and, you know, having him give me business 101, that's really where I, I learned the business side of it. It's just surrounding myself with people who really do know the business. Mm. And so I can be creative. So I mean, it seems like in general that part of this shift, this millennial shift, if we want to keep on that theme, is, is that there isn't a disconnect necessarily mm -mm. between doing good and doing well. I mean, that's basically what you're all trying to do. Yeah. Do we do we have um, we have one more question before we bring Kay up? I think that we could we could ask coming down. Uh, hi there, Fabio Silva, class of two thousand and three. Um, I'm curious as to what advice you would give someone who is Generation X, who after I think following much more of the the formal path in a career. Uh, 20 years in, now starting up their own business. Uh, feeling a little paralyzed sometimes, wondering what, measure, what I'm supposed to be looking at in terms of measurable results. Hmm. So that I get up, charged up, feeling like I know what I need to get done that day, and go to bed feeling like I've accomplished something. Like, what do you look at to see that you're actually making progress? even if at the end of the day it's not a new client or revenue, so that you feel like as if you're still moving forward. Fabio, which program did you graduate from? Fashion design. Thank you. That's a really great question. <laughs> oh, yeah. wow. Um, well, as I think Angela already said this, I don't think you ever no, like you're never ready for this, I feel. Like no matter how, you know, you could take 20 years in a business and you still won't necessarily feel the readiness that you feel when you kind of say, okay, I'm gonna start my own business and then you just plunge in the deep end. So you never can really prepare for that, I don't think, because I'm only 24, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but just put that out there. Um, but for me, um, I give myself sort of milestones and little satisfaction barriers, uh, sorry, a little criteria, and because obviously there isn't such an uh, income for me, I'm not really, I don't have revenue, I don't have income, um, but I do, I, I measure my successes in if I have designed something that works, <laughs> um, and, and, you know, in the testing phases, for me, the success comes from, you know, is this a great design, can it benefit many people, um, can it work for, you know, wheelchairs, can it work for, you know, crutches or Zimmer frames? And that to me is when I get my little success. But I think it's when you found your niche or found what it is that you're all charged up for that you can really know um, what it is that makes you feel successful because it's not necessarily in the money side or it's not necessarily with who you're working, your clients or, you know, what magazine you, you're it featured in. It's all about, like, if you have accomplished what you set out to do in small sections. That's what I think, anyway. 
Uh, Tony Robbins has this really great quote where he says, mm -hmm. people often overestimate what they could do in a year and underestimate what they could do in 10 years. And um, I've come to realize like, over the span of my career, uh, what was really horrible for me personally uh, was the moment that I set all these goals for myself. This is what I have to do this quarter. This is what I have to get done mm -hmm. this year. Um, and it was really debilitating for me in the sense that I was always stressed out. And um, I've switched my thinking to like, how do I feel about things? Like when I get up in the morning, like do I feel happy? Do I feel joyful about what I'm building or is it the complete opposite? And if it's the complete opposite, it's time to sit down and like start figuring out what you're doing wrong. So I know that in the business world, we often like, use goal-oriented systems, but I found that just like when you're at it like, you know, months and a year and two years, like this like goal um, setting um, society that we have, I do feel that it, it gets too much to the point that people drive themselves a bit insane rather than being so happy about the small wins. Um, so I've adjusted myself to that kind of um, approach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I say that, it's amazing to see how it's so different from profession that we're all taking, to see what each of us see as a, uh, uh, an improvement moving forward and how our careers are developing. And, and like for, my, for me, for myself, um, I would say that even learning, being able to learn a concept that was so foreign to me on one day is a small progress to moving forward because I feel like even a concept is so you know, it's basic, but it's, like it's, so, it's so, so important to what you're trying to well, and why you're trying to put forth. And, and even if, um, as an, an architect, um, uh, it was just like, how can even a, an architect trying to like, design for resilient homes, for example, like how even in, when like, a, a home is still like, standing up, or like, you know, like, this is like tangible goals. But, like, it doesn't have to be so apparent. It can be as long as having a successful conversation with somebody that is, um, you know, has been affected, and how can we then like, exchange ideas and, and okay, we got our point across and how we can work together to move forward. It's like very, at times it cannot be, it, I mean, it's just like adding to the bigger overall picture, which goes back to how 10 years span come together in these little moments to really uh, create the whole picture of how you're trying to push forward as a mm -hmm. career. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely think it's about um, setting more small goals for yourself and not really necessarily having a timeline for these like for these goals and a deadline. So like you have to have five goals a week. Um, like there are some some weeks and some days where I feel like um, I haven't made any goals, and then there's some days where I'm like, wow, I've got like 10, 10 of my goals I guess set today. So um, I guess it's really kind of like an organic process, and you know then you also do have you know, your long-term goals. Like, mm -hmm. I just felt like there's a wall back there that I didn't even know existed where everyone has, like, all the <laughs> speakers have come and signed and Ralph Lauren's there and Frank Gehry's there and I didn't even know that existed, but I just signed it right now and that's my life goal right now. So, <laughs> I had a goal today. So, <laughs> it's about letting it develop. But, yeah, <laughs> yeah so, um, you know, I think it's surprise goals come up, small goals, large goals, um, not so much of a timeline, but, uh, yeah, just feeling that you're doing you know, something successful, uh, maybe not every day, but when you kind of look back um, over the last few months or over the last years, you know, maybe it's, maybe it'll happen really fast, maybe it takes a while, but um, yeah, just, I think it's important to not limit yourself and not, not set deadlines, but just kind of keep an ongoing organic process. Mm -hmm. You know, if I translate a little bit what you're all saying, it's, it's interesting because the ability to approach big complex problems, because you're all dealing with big complex problems in your work, and doing so um, piece by piece, mm -hmm. small step by small step, which is essentially how you approach wicked problems. You can't solve them yeah. uh, all at one time. You have to approach them and change the shape of that problem, whether that's climate or, or water or, I mean, any, any of the issues, health that you're dealing with. Um, so it's, it's interesting how your approach to your life and work and career is actually consistent with an approach to complexity. Uh, mm -hmm. And maybe that is a generational thing. But I hope it is, because <laughs> you guys so. need to solve those problems. Um, listen, we are uh, we're a little bit over time, but we're, we are, first of all, I want to thank the four of you for joining us here. This was spectacular. Um, and we will follow your work very closely, because this is all about alumni reunion. So we can come back year after year and see what's going on. And, um, and there's a long tradition here. And so we'll be um, seeing this great success, I know. 
Uh, one of the um, great pleasures of my work as Dean of Parsons is to work with Kay Unger as the Dean, as the Chair. I just made you Dean. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness, I'm done. <laughs> um, the Chair of the Board of Governors, Kay. To follow this group and to always follow Joel, who is such an inspiration and so much of what you're seeing today and David Van Zandt, of what they brought to this university. And I want to just say to Lucy, Sophia, Nelson, and Angela, one, I feel so honored that I know you and the work that you're doing. And I think that what this shows is, yes, we have achieved number one, School of Art and Design, but more importantly, what an amazing community we are and each and every one of you and so many of the students here um, represent sort of to the core the mission of social good. And bravo. <laughs> So of course, every, my 2,000 notes that are here that I was going to speak about, thank goodness most of you took care of it. And just an overall thank you to everybody that Joel mentioned. I just want to point out one thing. I noticed Muriel Taub Guns, uh, Gunsman, correct, who graduated here in 1945, just joined us. So let's give her a hand. And again, thanks to the, and there's many students here. We're so thrilled you're here. But to all of you, um, why am I here? And I'm the lucky one. And I'm so lucky in that you really said so much today about what I wanted to talk about. Now, I just finished, I'm Jewish, okay? So we just finished the highest holidays. I don't know what you know about that, but as of this week, we had to repent, we had to fast, then we eat, you go to synagogue, and at the end of all this praying and what, what all we do, the president of the synagogue walks to the front, everybody tries to run out because then they're gonna ask for money. <laughs> <laughs> I promise I'm not. <laughs> More importantly, I'm gonna tell you what it feels like to be here, to feel good about this amazing place, and that they all talked about, and some, you know, Nelson, you were in architecture, the rest were in fashion, and how you each have approached it so differently. You're entrepreneurs. I was an entrepreneur for over 49 years, and nothing prepares you for that, in fact, what my advice would be after being around a long time, which is why I can talk to Lucy and Angela and so on, is a couple of things. One, as alumni, what can we give back to these kids? I know you're looking at them today thinking, oh my God, and they are amazing and what they've learned, but they need a lot from us. And also one of the things I want to accomplish today, and as we go across the street, to the Sheila Johnson Center, the Making Center. It's an opportunity for us to talk to each other. And we want to know, as me, as chairman of the board and my fellow board members, and I have an amazing board of over 30 members, we want to know what can we do for you? How can we get you involved? How do you want to be involved? And how can you give back in many different ways? And sometimes it's just by mentoring. But when I went to Parsons, by the way, I graduated in 1968. I'd like to think I was 10, but I wasn't. <laughs> I went to college first. But I was very fortunate, and I was raised um, from a family that was pretty well-to-do, but while I was at Parsons, my father passed away. And I was, um, by the time I was a sophomore, I was married. And my mom thought, well, I'm not gonna pay for your schooling. You're married now, you know, take care of your husband, so on and so forth. I wanted to be a designer. Look, I wrote a letter when I was eight years old. <laughs> if I hadn't received and won several scholarships, I never would have been able to finish. So I just wanna, I'm not gonna ask you for money, but I want you to remember, one, 
What happened to me? I was lucky. And I won these scholarships, I finished. I had an amazing career. Not always good. I was an entrepreneur. What do entrepreneurs do? We do all these things that if we knew what we were doing, we would never do them again. <laughs> right? That's true. I was in business. I built a huge business, $125 million business. My partner stole all the money. I went bankrupt. We don't often talk or share about the downs, only the ups. And my dad taught me before he died, he said, you don't know the top till you've seen the bottom and you've worked your way back up. And I don't want everybody to experience that, but I'm sure you guys are gonna go through some of that. We need to help them, try and teach them and share our, our experiences, if nothing else, of the good and the bad. And I'm the lucky one here. I am learning from them every day. And four years ago, I sold my shares in my company I'd done it, I had kids, grandchildren, all that. But to be honest, and this is one thing they are, and they share, they're very open and transparent and sharing. I was sick of it. The fashion business was not making me happy anymore. Even though I traveled for 30 weeks a year for 49 years, I made sure that every show I did, a portion of the money was given back. But what I learned, it was the giving back that made me happy. So my luckiest day was when Joel finally convinced me to say yes to being chairman of the board. And I learn every single day here. And I get the pleasure. I'm going back to school all the time. And when you go across the street, if you hadn't been there yet, you're going to see why my passion is the scholars Nelson, this was the first thing I ever gave to here, <laughs> and helping educate kids as young as possible because so often the arts are forgotten. And the arts are the way so many of us learn. And many of us learn differently. And the arts are how we express ourselves. But when Joel took me through that making center and I saw this raw space that could really make the difference, not only in technology and changing the future, but like Lucy's project and meeting Chat, who I was happy enough to introduce you to, the great work that they're doing for hospitals and patients and people of all sizes and everything is something that we're teaching here. But now in that making center, what they share that maybe we didn't when we were at Parsons is this interdisciplinary um, experience together where things will crash and you might be next to a music student and next to an architecture student. What's going to happen in that making center is where innovation and fabulous inventions are going to happen. So it has been my pleasure and continues to be to work hard and to give back because that's what makes me happy. Thank you.